Well, we've made it almost halfway through the book of Acts, and we've just finished, uh, I think, a, a tremendous chapter. I love the story that uh, Luke tells as we, we read about the uh, story of Peter's release from prison. We, we have uh, the story of Rhoda, and again, one of my childhood favorite verses as we got near the end of chapter 12, Herod was eaten by worms and, and died. I loved that. Um, it's almost as fun as the story of Ehud in the Old Testament. You'll have to go back and look that up. But What's interesting is that as fun as Acts chapter 12 is, as, as important as it, as it is, it's almost a sidetrack for Luke. And here's what I mean by that. If you go to the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of uh, chapter 13, it actually kind of forms one story. And so Luke's chased a little bit of a rabbit in, in chapter 12. And I just want to point that out to you. If we, if we go back to the end of chapter 11, we read about the, the church in Antioch. And the disciples, each one according to his need, provided for the help of the brothers in Jerusalem. And uh, they did this by sending their gift by the elders of Barnabas and Saul. That's the end of chapter 11. And then we come to the last verse of chapter 12, which we skipped last week intentionally. But the last verse of chapter 12 just continues that story. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John also called Mark. And so chapter 12 is kind of this inclusio. Chapter 12 is this sidetrack, a rabbit trail, and a great one at that. But chapter 13 picks up where we left off in chapter 11. Now remember chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the beginning of this this Gentile church uh, in Antioch. And the church there, it's established with Gentiles. The gospel is preached to the Gentiles. And and we see that uh, there, the, the birth of the Gentile church. And chapter 11, it ends beautifully where this new founded church actually hears about a famine in Jerusalem. And so they take up an offering, each one according to their ability. They send back an offering to the mother church back in Jerusalem. And actually that's where the story picks up again at the end of chapter 12. We read about that church in Antioch and we read Saul and Barnabas making their way back up there. That's where we find ourselves. So I hope you have your Bible. We're going to start just by looking at the first three verses of chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, There were prophets and teachers, and we get the list of these five guys. Barnabas, Simeon called Nigar, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I've called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And so we see the the story resuming back up in Antioch. Remember this newly established church there. And it's interesting, as you think about this church, I I told you last week that Antioch, it was the third largest city in the known world. And because it was a large city, it had everything that large cities have with it, including the good and the bad. The interesting thing about Antioch is Antioch was kind of a melting pot of all kinds of people. And that's part of the reason why the Christians fled there when there was persecution. They could kind of blend in and different people groups from all over. But the interesting thing about Antioch is with all the different kinds of people, They didn't get along well. In fact, you read stories about Antioch and all these different groups and nationalities of people, all the different types of uh, Greeks and the the Romans and people from different parts of the world and now uh, Jews and Christians, they didn't have anything to do with each other. In fact, the Greeks did it not at all like the Romans. And the Romans felt the same way about the Greeks. And so they didn't like each other. The Greeks, the Romans, they didn't get along. The Jews... They didn't like anybody unless they were Jewish. And we get this place and these people groups from all over the world that they didn't like to be around each other. We read stories of Antioch and the rich despised the poor. The educated looked down on the uneducated. The Romans thought they were king of the world. And we read about a city where there was great diversity and yet the people did not get along. And then we read about a church that's established in that area. And the interesting thing is there's no hint at all of that in the church. In fact, just the opposite. We find a great melting pot where people loved each other and got along. In fact, it's interesting that we're, we're told about five, five people. They're, they're called prophets and teachers. Now, remember, prophet can mean not only foretelling the future, but also foretelling the gospel. And we get five leaders in this church, and it's interesting to look at these five men because they're men of great diversity. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find five guys that were more different than the five guys that we have listed for us. And so we get this list, list of people, five names of teachers, and they tell a great deal about the church. 
First of all, we get Barnabas, and we've been studying about Barnabas. He's the one that's gone up and started the, the, the church there. But remember, he is a Hellenistic Jew, and so he's not a Hebraic Jew. He's from Cyprus. He's a, a, a Levite, and he's not from Jerusalem. And so we understand that he's part of this diaspora. When the, when the Jews were earlier scattered, he was raised in a Greek culture, and that's part of the reason why he's the one sent up to this, this place in Antioch. And so he's in touch with Greek culture. He's sympathetic to their way of life, and that's probably why he's sent there. But understand, a Grecian Jew. And then we get a list of people that are probably new to us, or, or maybe not. We get this guy called Simeon. He's called Nigar. Now, that simply, it's the word, word for black. But it tells us where he's from. He's actually literally from North Africa. He's from what we would call Libya. Now, the interesting thing about Simeon is we probably do know him from somewhere else. This is probably Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross after Jesus. It's probably the father of two men that we're going to know. and We're going to read about them in the book of Mark. We're also going to read about them in, in, the, um, in the book of Romans. He's probably the father of two guys, Alexander and Rufus. And so, but notice we, we've identified where he comes from. He's from North Africa. And we get another guy, a third guy in here. His, his name is Lucius, and we're told where he's from. He's from Cyrene. Now, the interesting thing about Lucius is he is probably among the people who first brought the gospel to Antioch, but we see, again, a different part of the country. His name is actually a Latin name. We know that he grew up in a Roman culture. And so we're starting to see great di diversity. A man brought up in Roman culture and a guy that, that uh, is from from North Africa and a guy that was from Cyprus. And then we get another man, and even it becomes more interesting in our story. Now, you might just kind of pass over his name until you see what's written about him. We get this guy named Menean. And then this comment. He was raised with Herod the Tetrarch. Now let me stop and remind you of who this is, but even before that, I want you to underline the word Tetrarch in your Bible. It's going to become important for us. But Herod the Tetrarch, this guy was raised with Herod the Tetrarch. Now, we know lots of different Herods. Which guy is this? This is Herod Antipas. He was raised with Herod Antipas. Now, Antipas is the guy that, that cut off John the Baptist's head. Herod Antipas is the one that Jesus stood trial before. And we get an interesting term here about him. He's, he's brought up with Herod Antipas. The word's actually much stronger than that. In fact, it's a compound word in Greek. It's a word that, that uh, if, if we look at this, it's actually um, a word that means he had the same mom as. Centrophus, the same mother, or maybe it's the same nursemaid. And so not only, uh, they were raised together. They were raised as brothers. And think about this. We get a man now in Antioch who becomes one of the preachers of the gospel message who was actually raised with Herod. And I think about this, what a contrast, what, what a different lifestyle, what a different path these two guys made, one who's going to uh, try Jesus, one who's going to cut off the head of John the Baptist, another who becomes a preacher of the, the gospel. And I want to tell you, that's something rather significant. What a contrast. Not only was this man raised with a Herod, but this man became a Christian. Not only did he become a Christian, he became a leader. Not only become a leader, he's, no, he's numbered among the great teachers in the church at Antioch. And then, of course, we, we get a fifth name. And we understand who this is as well. We get the fifth name, Saul. And we know his story. A Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he calls himself a Hebraic Jew. He, he took it upon himself to persecute the church before he has an encounter with Jesus himself. And he becomes also a preacher of the gospel. I want to tell you, these five names that are listed for us, different cultural backgrounds. You could not imagine people with five different various backgrounds that were more culturally diverse and really five guys that if they were standing in a room together, you'd probably say, yeah, they're not going to like each other much. And yet in the church, these, these men come together and they become leaders in this church so different, from the, so different from the culture around them. You see, these five guys are actually very well equipped to take the gospel message to a city that was very diverse and didn't like each other. These five guys are actually very well equipped to do ministry in Antioch and take the gospel message to both the Greeks and the Romans and the Jews and the slaves and the frees, free people. And they're able to stand up and say, guess what? The gospel message is for people just like you because it's a message for people just like me. And so five very diverse guys. But what happens there, I want to stop and remind you what's happened. Uh, Barnabas is the guy that's taking the gospel message there, and the churches begin to grow. And as the church began to grow, it didn't take him very long to realize this is much bigger than I am. And so very early on, Barnabas needed help. And remember what he did? 
Barnabas, when he needed help, he thought, who is it that I can go and can accept all kinds of people from various backgrounds and various lifestyles? And he thought about his earlier years and an encounter that he had with a man named Saul. And remember, Barnabas is the man that stood up for Saul and introduced him to the, the teachers in Jerusalem. And, and Barnabas is the one that's going to go now, and he's going to do a manhunt for Saul. And so he goes all the way up to Tarsus. He goes up to Tarsus, he gets Saul, and he brings him back, and he invests his life, two or three years, in this man Saul. And so we know it's because of Barnabas that Saul actually becomes equipped to be a preacher of the gospel. What's interesting is it doesn't just happen with Saul. We actually realize Barnabas has done the same thing with these other men that are listed for us. You see, Barnabas realizes that for the church to be effective, to really increase his, his, his ministry, when he needed help, not only did he recruit Saul, but he also likely recruited these other people from various different backgrounds to come and help him. And even more interesting is we realize this list of five guys, Barnabas and four others that he's invested in and trained, this list is not exhaustive. In fact, actually, even in this passage, we see that he adopts, if you will, a fifth we came across the name John, who's also called Mark, right? He brings him back from Jerusalem and invests in him. It's his cousin. But he invests in him so much so that we know John takes the name Mark, and he's the author of, of our second gospel, the gospel of Mark, another man that Barnabas has invested in. You see, Barnabas established this practice, this priority of training other people in ministry. We know that Barnabas made the word of God a priority and thought, here's the one thing you must know. You must know the word of God. You've got to know the gospel message, and you've got to be able to preach that and proclaim it. And so he trains these people. In fact, he trains leaders for the ministry so much so that when the churches gather together, and as they're praying and as they're fasting, the Holy Spirit comes on the church and says, you need to send some men. He has done such a good job of training the people in the church of Antioch that when it comes time to send men out to do a missionary journey, Barnabas and Saul are actually selected, and they are sent off. The very best qualified leaders in the church are sent off, and it's okay. You know why? Because Barnabas has invested his life in the life of other people, and the church at Antioch, it's a, a rock-solid church, a new church plant, but a rock-solid church that for years to come, in fact, for the next four centuries, becomes really the, the center of Christian missions. It's because Barnabas had enough vision to say, I need to invest my life in other people and train them and equip them and send them into the, into the ministry. Well, it's at that time that we really find, and if you don't have this in your Bible, when we get down to 13, chapter 13, the, verse 3, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This is the beginning of what we call the missionary journeys. In fact, you might just write in your Bible right here, this is the first missionary journey. This happens about 46, or 40, 46 through 48 A.D., and that's where we find ourselves. We, we see that Barnabas and Saul are sent off into their work. And notice that. They, they, they send them off in the work. You might even underline that word, uh, uh, word as well because uh, it's interesting that the first missionary journey starts with Paul and Barnabas going off to their work. And the third missionary journey is also in, concluded with they came back from their work. And we see this inclusio again. But notice we, we get down to the work in Cyprus. And I want you to pick up the story in verse 4. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they, they proclaimed the word of God in Jewish synagogues. John, now again, that's John Mark, the writer of the gospel. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. They met a Jewish sorcerer, well, that's an interesting thought, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul. Now, there's again a, a word I want you to underline. In fact, you can underline it several times. Notice the phrase, he was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, an intelligent man sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the sorcerer, for that's what the name means, opposed them. He tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. And Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Eliamus and said, you're a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You'll never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind, and for a time, you'll be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. He was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. we do get the beginning of the missionary journeys here. Now, here's what happens. Barnabas and Saul, they're, they're sent off, 
And they're sent off to this large island. It's, it's off the coast of Turkey. It's, uh, it's, actually, it's actually Barnabas' home, home area. This is where he came from. And I want to suggest to you that's probably the determining factor. When it's time to send out the gospel, they, they send Barnabas to a place that he's well familiar with. Now, this is a, a large island. He came from a small city on that island. But most of the island and many cities on that island had not heard the gospel. But he knew the territory. He knew the people. And so they go there, begin, beginning there, and they preach the gospel there. And many people believe. And it's interesting that, that something happens. There's actually one man that hears about the gospel message and actually sends for Barnabas and Saul and says, I want you to come come preach the gospel to me. He's an important person. He's a pro counsel. Now, I've just got to stop there, and I've told you this before, but Luke is very specific. Luke is very articulate. Luke gives us very detailed pictures of what goes on. And because of that, skeptics like to, like to try to find fault with Luke, although they've been unable to do that. And one of the things they, they, they like to find fault with is they, they say this, hey, we know that this island of Cyprus, it isn't Roman territory, and so there wouldn't have been a proconsul there. And they try to attack both the, the phrase he uses for Herod, I had you underline it, tetrarch. And they also like to find fault with this word proconsul, which is actually used four times in our, our passage. And what they want to, want to say is, hold a second, this isn't a Roman territory, except it was. Here's the problem with those people that want to find fault with the Bible. Actually, Rome in 57 B.C. annexed Cyprus. And then later on in 22 B.C., they changed the rule from the emperor in Rome to a ruling senate in Rome. And when that happened, guess what they did? They put up tetrarchs in places. And guess what else they did? They put up proconsuls in places. And actually what Luke tells us is exactly right about what goes on. And so they try to find fault with Luke, and actually they're the ones with egg on their face, if they knew their history, they'd realize that the proconsuls were in subjection to the Tetrarch, who were in subjection to the Senate of Rome. And so it's important. But it's interesting that this guy wants to, to, to know about Jesus, and so he sends for, for Barnabas and Saul, and there's another man who previously has had the ear of the proconsul. He's this Jewish sorcerer, and his name literally is Bar-Jesus. Now, the word Bar in Hebrew is just the word son of, son of Jesus. Now, lots of people named Jesus in the early world. So he's got son of Jesus, and he's a, he's a, a magician. He's a false prophet. He's been trying to lead the, the, uh, the proconsul astray. But the proconsul, he's an he's a intelligent man, the Bible says, and he wants to know the story. And so they come and preach to him. And here on the side is this guy that he's trying to say and lead the proconsul astray, Bar-Jesus. Bar and I, I love what Barnabas and Saul do. They look at this guy, and Saul actually says to him, man, you're a wicked man, and I know that you're, you're probably never going to believe, and so here's what's going to happen. You're going to be blind, and I think, that'd be great today. Anybody that's arguing with Christ, let's just, wouldn't it be, you know, it'd be, I just thought, man, if God only worked that way. But I, as I, I'm thinking about this, this guy is trying to turn the proconsul away, and he, his heart is not right, and he really is an evil man. And Saul actually uses a, a play on words. Hey, you, you're, you are the son of Jesus. You're the son of salvation, and yet that's really not who you are. You're actually bar Satan. You're, you're bar devil. You're the son of the devil, and you're not doing what's right. And so he strikes blindness on this guy, and I, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe it's because this guy truly is spiritually blind, and so to rep represent that, uh, you're going to be physically blind for a while as well. Or then I start thinking about Saul's own conversion. And remember what happens to Saul? Saul is blinded by Jesus. And maybe he's doing this, trying to get the guy's attention, saying, I want to give you a chance too. But some amazing thing hap things happen. In fact, I've got three things that I want to point out about this passage. That really three developments that happen here that you'd be, you'd be wise to remember. Uh, the first one is simply this. Notice this proconsul. His name is Sergius Paulus. He's a proconsul. Here's what's significant about this. This is actually the first truly Gentile convert that comes to Christ with no previous religious background in Judaism. Now, we've had other Gentiles, but this is the first one specifically we know. We get, for example, we get the Ethiopian eunuch. But remember what was the Ethiopian eunuch was doing as, as he's converted to Christ? He's actually re reading scripture. Or we get the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, right? And his whole household is converted. And they're, they're Gentile people. But remember, he's called a God-fearer. Hey, here's the first one. He's, he's truly a Gentile con, uh, conversion that has no experience with Christ before that. So it becomes important. But not only that, understand who this is. This is a Roman official. 
His title is significant, and we understand here's a person of prominence that's, that now comes to Christ. And the interesting thing about that is because Luke has been, been writing to Theophilus, maybe even in defense of Paul in Rome, this would have been a significant detail. But look, the gospel message has gone forth. It's even gone forth to people like this proconsul, And so that's a significant thing that we should remember, that the, the gospel has, has come, come even to the proconsul Sergius Paulus. But there's something else that I, I want to point out, just a, another interesting factor about this. It's in the middle of this story that for the very first time, we see Saul called Paul. Now, we're in chapter 13, right? This is the very first time in Scripture that Saul is actually called Paul. And we've talked about this before, but I need to remind you that Saul and Paul actually aren't two different names. It's not like Paul has his name changed. We usually think that happens at his conversion. But actually, Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul is his Roman name. And here, right now, it marks the beginning, the very first time he's called that. It also marks the beginning of this missionary outreach. And Paul is being sent to the Gentiles, and it's now that he starts taking his Gentile name. He's been preaching in and around Jerusalem and other places, but now, as he goes on this missionary journey, as he's going to the Gentiles, he assumes his Gentile name. And I want to say it's significant. Not only that, is this the first time that he's called Paul in Scripture? It's actually the last time he's called Saul, except sometimes Paul, a couple times Paul recounts his vision, and he says, as I was traveling on the road to Damascus, a voice came from heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But this is the the first time called Paul, and really the last time in Scripture that he's called Saul. But there's also a third interesting thing that I want to point out, an important development here. And I want you to notice the language. Up until this point in the book of Acts, it's always been Barnabas and Saul, And do you notice what happened in this passage? Actually, we not only get Paul's name changed, but there's a change from every time previously it's been Barnabas and Saul. There's a change that takes place here. It's now Paul and Barnabas. In fact, if we go one verse past where we read earlier, we go down to verse 13, we actually get even stronger than that. It's no longer Barnabas and Saul. It's not even Paul and Barnabas. Actually, when we get to verse 13, it's Paul and his companions. There's a change that takes place right here, and it's rather interesting. You see, Barnabas actually takes a back seat. And that's interesting because Barnabas has been the leader. Barnabas has been in the faith longer. It's Barnabas who vouched for Saul in Jerusalem saying, you should take a chance on this guy. It's Barnabas that's gone out and sought out Saul and brought, brought him back to Antioch and trained him for ministry. It's Barnabas that's invested in him. And it's been Barnabas who's been the tutor of, of Saul until this point. And now the one who's been recruited for ministry actually becomes the leader in ministry Paul becomes the leader of the missionary team. And I just want to point out something to you that we often forget. We read the story and we usually think, okay, Paul, Saul is converted. He changed his name to Paul. He becomes this great missionary. Actually, it doesn't work like that at all. Paul has actually been in the background for a long time. In fact, we are now 13 years in. We're 13 years after his conversion. He spent three years in Arabia. He spent probably about seven years back in his hometown, Tarsus, before Barnabas goes and recruits him. He spent now three years in Antioch with Barnabas under his training. He spent a little bit of time in Jerusalem taking the offering down there. But as we get to Acts chapter 13, what you need to realize is actually Barnabas has been in the lead and Saul has been in the background for 13 years. At this point, Barnabas, he's likely middle-aged. He's in his late 40s or early 50s. I I like to think of him as he's probably 47. That's a great age and... Oh, that's my age, um, by the way. But, and to this, this point, Paul's been in the background. And the truth of the matter is, to this point, Paul hasn't been used much. And he's middle-aged. But from this point on, late 40s, early 50s, Paul's going to be used by God. In fact, he's going to do more for the church than any other man except Jesus himself. I mean, it's Paul who gives us the majority of our New Testament books. It's Paul who's going to go out and lead on these missionary journeys. Paul, to this point, hasn't been used much, but he will be. And I just think, uh, I just had this thought. God has been preparing him all this time for significant service. And maybe that's true in your life. 
Maybe you think, okay, I haven't accomplished much. God hasn't used much. What if God has been choosing and using and preparing you? What if God has been preparing you for even more useful service in the future? And here's what happens. Chapter 13, I told you, write it in. This becomes the beginning of the missionary journey, the first one. Chapters 13 and 14, they, they are the first missionary journey. And I just have this thought also. What would happen if, if Barnabas hadn't invested in the life of Saul? Uh, what if Barnabas not only hadn't invested in the life of Saul, but what if Barnabas hadn't invested in, in people like Lucas and Menean and other people? You see, what we find in chapter 13 is the church is together and they're praying and they're fasting and they're under God's leadership and and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, hey, it's time to go and get this, this thing on the road. It's time to, to follow up the Great Commission. And the Holy Spirit says, you need to send out people. And they're able to send out their very best, Barnabas and Saul. And the reason they're able to do that is because Barnabas has invested in his life in other people. And so as he leaves the church in Antioch, the church in Antioch is in great hands. And it is a leader in the, in the church, a, a leader of the missionary movements. And so we understand that... Um, what it would have happened if Barnabas hadn't done that? And I look at that, and I want to come, and I want to stop, and I want to give us three applications, the second part of your outline there. As, as we see the Holy Spirit calling out Barnabas and Paul, and three applications. And the first one is simply this. I want to suggest to you, and sometimes we think, okay, this is ministry preparation, but I want to suggest to you that every person must re be reduplicating their ministry, or let's even get more general than that, reduplicating their legacy. Usually we read a passage like this and say, hey, it's a great story, and I realize how great a person Barnabas was, and thank, thank God that, that Barnabas trained Paul. But I want to suggest to you this has an application for us because actually each one of us should be we should be leaving behind a legacy. Whether you're in professional ministry or not, each of us should be leaving a legacy. Each person must be reduplicating their life and their story in someone else. And here's what it looks like. Moms, you should be investing in the life of your children. What legacy are you leaving behind? Are you reduplicating what you know in their life? Dads, are you doing that with your sons? Are you investing in your sons in such a way that they are gonna carry on your legacy? Or who are you leaving that to? Are you leaving it to public schools or to our government? Who is it that's investing in the life of your kids to make sure they're godly, God-fearing people? They're going to carry on the legacy of your name. More than that, they're carrying on the legacy of Christ's name. I want to tell you that we've got a job to do. Grandparents, who are you going to leave training your grandchildren to? Or, or maybe you think, okay, this passage really is specifically about ministry, but I'm not in ministry. Now, hold a second. What would happen if maybe you're an attender of the church what, what would happen if you simply decided to invest your life in somebody else and help them become an attender of the church? Or more specifically, maybe you become a member. What would it be like if you said, hey, here's the journey I've taken, and you helped encourage somebody else to become a member? Or you're a baptized believer, and you thought, I'm going to make it my job, my task, to help somebody reach the point where I am. You see, that's part of this. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Investing your life in the life of somebody else. Or maybe you have a ministry. Maybe your ministry is greeting, or you're an usher, or you're a server, or a teacher. Maybe you're doing the important jobs of being a sound tech or a lawn tech. All those things are extremely important in the life of the church. What if you simply said, I'm going to help reduplicate because there may be a time when I can't do it. I'm going to reduplicate my life and the life of somebody else or a VBS volunteer or a small group leader or my favorite, we, ha we encourage mugging, right? Uh, muggers are, are the people that take out cups. They mug people um, that, that attend. It's just a great name. But you understand my point? What would it be like if the church, we intentionally decided we want to raise up a next generation besides us. We, we want to have somebody uh, trained and equipped to do something that I'm already doing. Maybe it's a great public ministry. Maybe it's behind the scenes. But what if we invest in our lives and life of other people? That's exactly what we see Barnabas doing. And it's because Barnabas has trained other people to do his job that Barnabas is able to go out and be on the, the missionary journeys. And I want to tell you, each one needs to be reduplicated in their ministry. But more than that, I want to take you back to verse 2. Did, did you catch, and I know we went over it briefly, the Holy Spirit calls Barnabas and Saul. Did you notice what the church was doing when, when Barnabas and Saul were called? If you go back and read verse 2, we read, while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting. The church was actually coming together, and they were praying and they are worshiping. Even more than that, we actually read a, a word here. It's the very word we get our word liturgy from, and yet we have that messed up. Liturgy is all those those things, liturgical things we do when we come to church. The, church, the word actually means performing service. 
They were coming together and performing services of worship to God. Here's what we find, the church coming together and ministering, the church coming together and worshiping and providing acts of service. And while they're doing that, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They're fasting and they're praying. You see, this church is being led by God. And I really see something important here, that each person's got to be actively involved in worshiping and serving God if they want to hear the Holy Spirit. The reason they were able to hear the Spirit is because they were actively involved in listening to the Spirit. Does that make sense to you? They were coming together, and they were serving God, and they were praying, and they were fasting. They were dedicating themselves to the worship of God, and it's while the church was coming and doing that together that the Holy Spirit says, look, it's time for you to carry out the Great Commission. You need to send two people. And so I want to suggest to you not only that we need to be reduplicating our lives and the lives of other people, but we need to commit ourselves, each person, to actively being involved in worshiping and serving the Lord. It's only if we're really worshiping and serving the Lord that we'll be able to be guided by him. Which brings me to a, a, third, a third application. Not only are we supposed to be reduplicating ministry and being involved in worship, but it's interesting that the church there was willing to release Saul and Barnabas to go do further ministry. Can you imagine that? The church at Antioch. It's a young church. It's a church plant. Uh, when the Holy Spirit says, hey, you need to send some men, they look and say, who can we send? Let's send our very best. You thought that was a Hallmark slogan. It's actually a, a biblical slogan. Now, here's what they do. They take the very best. Who are the most qualified? Well, it's Barnabas, and who's next? It's Saul, who becomes Paul. They take their very best and said, the gospel message is so important that we're, we're gonna send the very best people out from here. And so the church, it thinks past itself, and it thinks to the future of the world. And I wanna tell you, unless and until the future of the world becomes more important than the future of the church, the church has no future. You see, the church is willing to send and invest in other people, and Antioch, it becomes a church planting church for generations, literally centuries. And the application is simply this. Each person needs to be willing to release other people into ministry, send other people into ministry, maybe even support other people as they go into ministry. Or maybe it's simply this, to be willing to be released into ministry. Uh, we see Saul willing to go and Barnabas willing to go and say, we'll go on behalf of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I wanna tell you, that's what the church is supposed to be about. In fact, I want to suggest to you that church, we need to be training and sending our very best people, our very best people into ministry. And here's what that looks like. We want to look at our youth and say, the brightest, the most capable, young men and young women, here's what we should be doing. We should be sending them to Bible college. We should be training them for, for ministry. We should be sending them out on the mission field and taking our very best and very brightest and saying, we want those people for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And we need to look around and find out those people that are serving well and say, guess what? The gospel is more important than just our church. Let's start sending people out. Let's be a church planting church. Let's start sending people out. And we don't just influence our little area for Jesus Christ. We influence all of, all of Idaho that maybe all the Northwest and maybe even beyond places like India or China, let's, let's be a church like Antioch. And I realize that Antioch is a church that really has adopted the Great Commission. They're going to take the gospel message not only from Jerusalem and Judea, but to the ends of the earth. And I, I look at the church of Antioch, and I see a church that was willing to reach and to teach and equip and to send. Those words sound familiar don't they? And I just wonder what it would be like. What would it be like if we became that kind of church? See, that's the kind of church that's worth being a part of. What, would you pray with me? Father, we want to stop and we want to come before you and realize until the future of the world is more important than the future of our church, our church has no future. And Father, we want to, we want to be used by you. We, we want to take what we know and what we have, and we want to share that with other people. And so help us feel a sense of uh, need of reduplicating our lives and the life of other people. And, and Father, help us truly stop and say, we want to worship you by serving you to our, our, our full ability. And Father, we want to be kind of, uh, the kind of church that not only sends, but releases people into ministry. And so Father, help us be that kind of church. Help that be true of us. We pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen.